And again, that's good. Okay, we are now on Facebook as well. So don't say anything that you don't want the internet to know forever. <laughs> Move this over here. All right. And a, another minute or so. And we'll see if we have some people who bow out of this whole event because this is the worst chapter in the whole Bible, according to me. It's the worst chapter in the whole Bible? Yeah, the worst chapter in the whole Bible. Like, I don't think okay. there's a worst chapter. Okay. I missed last week because the internet didn't like me. Our network at work was down today. Now I'm ready. Sorry, I'm also looking at the Lakers score before we start. So I can. Did the they start winning? They didn't, did uh, they start, they didn't start playoffs yet, did they? No, no. And, and the Lakers are currently tied 45-45 with the Bulls and I. I really need them. Uh, if they don't win, I really don't care. It's the last piece of sports I actually care about at all. All right. <laughs> it is six o'clock and maybe uh, this will be us because people are like, if anyone read this chapter in advance, there can certainly be people who don't want to participate today. And I don't judge them at all for that. <laughs> but let's pray. God as we look into Judges 19. There will be those who hear this now or later and find it tremendously terrible because it is. So as we dive into what I believe might be the worst chapter in all of your scriptures, Give us eyes to see what you would have us see <clears throat> so that we might not shy away from the terror, but enter into it in an effort to bring light into the places where shadows reign. Not just in a world 3,000 years ago, but in our world in which many of us are still walking through the valley of the shadow of death now. Make this happen in accordance with your grace, we pray. Amen. All right. Has anyone read chapter 19 of Judges or? Not recently. Yes. Oh. All right. So at least some of you know what we're getting into. I, I ran ahead. Me too. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, you know. well, he said it's the worst chapter in the whole Bible such a big cliffhanger i was like i'm just gonna read it so and whitney uh, what did you think it was awful horrendous yes. i felt it, so terrible for the women yeah i know it, it is terrible and i'd love to say the last two chapters of judges somehow try to pick up from like hitting rock bottom but strangely they kind of dig past rock bottom a, a little bit <laughs> And uh, anyway, okay, so again, wherever you might be, if, uh, if you've experienced tremendous violence in your life, this may be triggering, and I only warn you of that, and we're going to try to take this as best we can, but we are going to read chapter 19 right now, and then after we read it, we're going to have a, a brief introduction of the last three chapters of uh, Judges, of which 19 is a part, and, uh, and then we're going to dive into 19 and uh, do our best. Okay, anyone want to read chapter 19, verses 1 through 9? This is not a terrible part yet, so you'll be all right. Okay, then I'll do it. <laughs> Let me un totally unmute myself Hang on. you are totally unmuted now i am i was pushing okay. the the space bar because i'm never really sure what the dog behind me will do i understand 
Now it came about in those days when there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite staying in the remote part of the hill country of Ephraim, who took a concubine for himself from Bethlehem to Judah. But his concubine played the harlot against him, and she went away from him to her father's house in Bethlehem in Judah, and was there for a period of four months. Then her husband arose and went after her to speak tenderly to her in order to bring her back, taking with him his servant and a pair of donkeys. So she brought, so she brought him into her father's house, and when the girl's father saw him, he was glad to meet him. His father-in-law, the girl's father, detained him, and he remained with him three days, so they ate and drank and lodged there. Now on the fourth day, they got up early in the morning, and he prepared to go. And the girl's father said to the son-in-law, sustain yourself with a piece of bread, and afterward you may go. So both of them sat down and ate and drank together. And the girl's father said to the man, please be willing to spend the night and let your heart be merry. Then the man arose to go, but his father-in-law urged him, so he spent the night there again. On the fifth day, he arose to go early in the morning, and the girl said, please, girl's father said, please sustain yourself and wait until afternoon. So both of them both of them ate. When the man arose to go along with his concubine and servant, his father-in-law, the girl's father, said to him, Behold, now the day has drawn to a close. Please spend the night. Lo, the day is coming to an end. Spend the night here that your heart may be merry. Then tomorrow you may arise early for your journey uh, so that you may go home. All right. So what do we see happening already? Something's being manipulated. Yeah, there's, there, this is already an odd story of some kind. Um, now, again, who are the Levites? Religion, the, tribe that, the tribe that, take, that do the priestly duties. The tribe that does the priestly duties. And so this is a priestly fellow, or at least it's supposed to be. And um, have you noticed the oscillation between like, is, is he, what's a concubine versus a wife? One's like a mistress that you pay. Yeah. And one and you so, obviously live with. So yeah. there's this odd oscillation between this concubine or, and occasionally she's even referred to as a wife. Uh, and, 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 and even in verse three, then her husband. Um, and, and so you're, you're not quite sure what the relationship is between them, except it's, it's, it's not like holy matrimony. Um, and uh, the translation that Kathy was reading from does a better job with the Hebrew scripture than my translation does. Um, which does a better job with the Greek translation of the Hebrew scripture. In verse two, when, uh, when, when, when my scripture says, uh, but his concubine became angry with him. And, uh, and, and, and the, the Hebrew says more like prostituted herself against. Um, and, and, and that can mean any number of things, but we don't know much of what's going on. And she does go to her father's house. Um, so she escapes him, whether it's because she becomes angry with him or uh, is a harlot, as it says, or, or whatever that might mean. She, she, she goes away from him. And after four months, he decides to, to go find her um, and, 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 and speak tenderly to her. So, so we're not sure what's going on. Um, it's just kind of confusing, but I, I I like the piece too, where it just says, you know, he's he's from the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim, and he took to himself a concubine, and and I think that's where I have to come initially to an understanding at all of this passage, because there are those who would say, okay, well, she's like a wife or something like that. He takes for himself a concubine. That's an interesting verb took what is what does the verb took suggest to you it sounds like one she didn't have any choice he just took her 
it does have that kind of piece. Now, if you can imagine someone just being kind of taken or something of that nature, maybe she has very little agency. And as we read the story, we find out that she has very little agency. Um, <laughs> Except for right away, she's taken and then whether she becomes angry or plays a harlot, whatever that might mean, she leaves him. And he goes back to talk to her and, and notice this whole play between her father and the Levite. What's going on there? He sees potential possibly. Yeah, we'll talk to about welcome it. him and hospitality, you know, all that. There's certainly I want the you with my daughter. Yeah. Or I maybe, mean, every maybe. time the every time the Levite wants to leave with his daughter, he wants them to stay around. It makes and, me think the father's plotting; he's going to do something. And it can feel that way. And and again, we don't know what's going on. And and we'll talk about it more and offer some theories. But I, I like your minds already thinking this way. You guys are doing a great job. Um. And uh, all right, let's read on. My dog won't shut up. I am sorry. <laughs> um. All right. How about anyone want to read verse ten through verse fifteen? I can read it. Thank you. But unwilling to stay another night, the man left and went toward Jabos, that is Jerusalem, with his two saddled donkeys and his concubine. When they were near Jabos and the day was almost gone, the servant said to the master, come, let us stop at this city of Jebusite and spend the night. His master replied, no, we won't go into an alien city whose people are not Israelites, we will go to Gebeth. Gebeah. Gebeah. He added, Come, let's try to reach Gebeah or Ramah and spend the night in one of those places. So they went on, and the sun set as they neared Gebeah in Benjamin. They were stopped. There they stopped to spend the night. They went and sat in the city square, but no one took them into his house for the night. All right. Now, again, curious, curious, curious. Now, before the time of King David, uh, Jerusalem wasn't Jerusalem. Jerusalem took over, or David took over what would become Jerusalem. And so this is before the time of the kings. We keep hearing that. Um, we heard it in the first verse. And so the Jebusites were in what becomes Jerusalem, and the servant of the Levite says, we should stop here and rest. And the Levite says, no, we should, you know, go to a place where the Israelites are uh, there, and we're not going to do that with foreigners or aliens. And um, what do we know about ancient Near East hospitality customs? I, I was going to say, I was thinking about uh, Leviticus, that this is kind of vi a violation and you're supposed to treat passerbys uh, as your guests and treat them well, I thought. No, you're, amen. And, and so, I mean, good. And maybe it's why it's good we went through Leviticus. We could have also figured this out from Deuteronomy or Exodus as well. Um, there's parts in Genesis um, that talk about the hospitality. Anyone been to the Middle East? And uh, Kathy, had, did you experience the hospitality of the Middle East at all while you were there, or was it? I was pretty fun? much on a tour, so okay. Um, so I can't really say that I, whether I did or didn't. Uh, it's still a, a place where the customs of hospitality are on full effect. Um, how, how about this? You know what they say about Southern hospitality? Anyone been to the Deep South? You, you might find some crazy things in the deep south, <laughs> but they are a hospitable people. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and I always appreciated my time there for that. Um, yeah, as Steve, you said, they're supposed to be hospitable. And I think part of the reason the Levite, who knows this, because the Levite is supposed to teach people the law anyway. Let's go to a place where the Israelites rule and we'll find the hospitality that we so desire to find. And so they passed by future Jerusalem 
to get to Gibeah here. And when they get to Gibeah, what do they find? They just go into the city center and no one takes them in to spend the night. Okay. Now we get to go on some more. Let's read 16 through 21, anybody. I can do that. Thank you, Tony. That evening, an old man from the hill country of Ephraim, who was living in Gabeah, the men of the place were Benjamites, came in from his work in the fields. When he looked and saw the traveler in the city square, the old man asked, where are you going? Where did you come from? He answered, we are on our way from Bethlehem in Judah to a remote area in the hill country of Ephraim, where I live. I have been to Bethlehem in Judah, and now I'm going to the house of the Lord. No one has taken me into his house. We have both, we have both straw and fodder for our donkeys and bread and wine for ourselves, your servants, me, your maidservant, and the young man with us. We don't need anything. You are welcome at my house, the old man said. Let me supply whatever you need. Only don't spend the night in the square. So he took him into his house and fed his donkeys, and they had washed their feet, and they had something to eat and drink. All right. So now, a, uh, again, the story is ongoing. They're waiting in the city square for anyone to show some hospitality. Now, again, this is 3,000 years ago. They don't have hotels or motels. Now, the people simultaneously have access, or the, the travelers, that is, Levite is concubine and a servant, have access to some foods to, of course, feed their donkeys and such. And notice who shows up. Night has hit, and now an old man shows up. Tells us an old man. And, and where is the old man from? Is he from um, Gibeah there? The frame. He's from Ephraim as well. Yeah. So he, he is of the same tribe as the Levite. And, and it's interesting that this is how it's portraying Benjamites. And while we'll talk about it in the slides, sometimes I can't help myself as we just start talking about things. Anyone know uh, what city and tribe King Saul, the first king of Israel, comes from? Benjamin. Benjamin. No. It's Gibeah. Like, oh. uh, like uh, some people, some scholars think um, all of Judges 17 to 21 is basically saying Saul's terrible and you get to go for David. Um, I don't know if that's true or not because everybody looks bad in this particular story at some point in time. But again, the Benjamites are not showing any of the hospitality they're supposed to. This old man shows up and they have this kind of peace where basically he offers them the kind of hospitality that he's supposed to offer. And when the old man says to them, peace be to you, I will care for all your wants, only do not spend the night in the square. Now, when you hear the peace be to you, that is a, an appropriate greeting. Um, Salam alaikum is still the, the, the Arabic greeting for all there, and that's peace be to you as well. Um, and uh, we're in Ramadan, so you might hear some of that anyway. What is going on? Oh, I don't sorry. know. Okay. Everything okay? Oh, sorry. I forgot I wasn't muted. I'll do it for you. Okay, cool. No problem. It's all good. That's the problem when you have that kind of love Zoom. I love Zoom um, for that reason. I'll care for, but have you, did you notice how it says only do not spend the night in the square? And you hear only do not spend the night in the square. And you're like, well, he doesn't want to spend the night in the square. But the way that it's said, can you almost hear the foreshadowing of don't be out there? It's not a safe space. And so the old man brings them into his house and fed the donkeys and washed their feet and they ate and drank. So this is an old man who's worked all day long, sees travelers in the city square. The travelers tell him, we don't need any of your stuff. We just need a place to stay. And he feeds their donkeys, feeds them, gives them drink and washes their feet. Who's the one that's showing 
the kind of hospitality they should be showing. The old man. The old man who's not even from there. So himself, a sojourn nerve source. All right. Um, on 19, I have a hard time figuring out who's talking, uh, who they're quoting, but it is interesting to me that they don't refer to it as a concubine, it's a maidservant. It, you kind of get the idea like maybe the Levite's a really old codger and he's got this young gal and, and they don't want to call it a wife or a concubine, so it's a maidservant. Amen. And the way that she keeps being treated, like called different things. And I mean, it's uh, for me and the woman and the young man is what my verse 19 says. I don't know what it is in the Hebrew, but if it's maidservant, it's probably not the word woman. And it's probably just the way the NRSV did it. But she keeps being called different things. Do we ever hear her speak so far? And we won't. No. No, she doesn't, she doesn't get to talk. Do we ever learn her name? No. All of this is part and parcel of the deterioration of society the judges has been portraying the Israelites to be a part of. Um, all right, I'm going to read the next part. It's, uh, it's what makes this the worst chapter in the Bible. Starting on verse 22. While they were enjoying themselves, that being the people in the house, the men of the city, a perverse lot, surrounded the house and started pounding on the door. They said to the old man, the master of the house, bring out the man who came into your house so that we may have intercourse with him. And the man, the master of the house, went out to them and said to them, no, my brothers, do not act so wickedly, since this man is my guest. Do not do this vile thing. Here are my virgin daughter and his concubine. Let me bring them out now. Ravish them and do whatever you want to them. But against this man, do not do such a vile thing. But the men would not listen to him. So the man seized his concubine, the man there being the Levite, and put her out to them. They wantonly raped her and abused her all through the night until the morning. And as the dawn began to break, they let her go. As morning appeared, the woman came and fell at the door of the man's house where her master was until it was light. In the morning, her master got up, opened the doors of the house, and he went out to go on his way. There was his concubine laying at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold. Get up, he said to her. We are going. But there was no answer. Then he put her on the donkey and the man set out for his home. When he had entered his house, he took a knife and grasping his concubine, he cut her into 12 pieces, limb by limb, and sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. And he commanded the men whom he sent, saying, Thus shall you say to all the Israelites, Has such a thing ever happened since the day that the Israelites came up from the land of Egypt until this day? Consider it, take counsel, and speak out. Yeah. That is some. Does this passage remind you of anything else in the Bible? Perhaps if it does, 
the only thing it might remind you of is Genesis 19. And if you don't remember Genesis 19 off the top of your head, I get it. It's when three angelic visitors, after having been hospitably entertained by Abraham, enter into the house of Lot and his wife and his daughters in the town of Sodom. And the men of the town of Sodom come to the door and tell Lot, bring out those men that you have in your house so that we might do to them what these men wanted to do to the Levite. All right, we're going to talk about this slowly. If you have questions at any point in time, let me know. If, uh, if you just want me to stop, let me know. Okay. So today with these, uh, we're just doing chapter 19 today, but this is a battered woman in a brutal war. And we're going to do a bit of an introduction here. So if you think things have been getting bad and maybe they couldn't get any worse, well, now we know they do. The story of the Levite and his concubine in Judges 19 is another one of Phyllis Tribble's text of terror. I don't know if anyone's ever read any of Phyllis Tribble or had a time to spend with her book, Text of Terror. Um, it's, it's a hard um, and, and yet beautiful book to read because I really appreciate how people will wrestle with the hardest parts of scripture. And um, after putting you through Revelation and now this, I promise you the next book we'll do will be much better. We're going to do uh, Philippians, um, the letter of joy. I, I figured doing the letter of joy after this is, is a good idea. Um, this is not the only text of terror that Phyllis Tribble talks about in her book. Um, it, from Judges, that is. Uh, we've already done the one of Jephthah's daughter. And uh, and if you think the details of the story are horrible, they are. But the aftermath of this rape and murder of the Levite's concubine involves a bloody civil war in which the tribe of Benjamin, um, of which, of course, it was the Benjamites that uh, did this atrocity, are nearly annihilated. And the misguided attempt to address the tragedy of their annihilation leads to the additional rapes of 600 women. That's the next two chapters of Judges. And so it's at this point that things truly cannot get any worse and the book of Judges ends. The rape of the Levite's concubine and the subsequent unraveling of any semblance of decency and order among the Israelites are integrally related. Scenes of rape in Judges 19 and Judges 21 frame this concluding section of Judges. This literary arrangement highlights their significance and one scholar summarizes as follows. These rape scenes are embedded within a gendered symbol system in which male authority is entrusted with control. In other words, it's a patriarchal culture and we can hear that in the way that the old man, who seems to be the only decent person in the story, quickly offers them his daughter and the concubine, uh, because it's still a patriarchal society. Um, but the system does not leave the feminine wholly disempowered or marginalized. The wars of men fall subject to the critique and judgment through these tales of rape and horror that is known through the eyes of these violated women. Woman's body is a sign for community connectedness and it's supposed to be con covenant there, not convenient and that needs to be changed immediately. <laughs> Coven, I don't know how to spell covenant off the top of my head, that's probably why. I'm, you know what? I'm gonna leave it like that for a moment. 
you know what it is. In these Hebrew narratives offers through images of victimization and violation, powerful rhetorical figures witness against the realities of brokenness within the human community. Why do we focus? Why do these terrible stories exist in the Bible at all? Because have you read the news? Have you seen the news? Do you know what's going on in the world? And I will constantly be reminded of how people want to take this book and tell me that they get all of their comfort in the world off of this. This is a book and this is a story that demands our repentance and demands us to take an honest look at the world. Now, Keith's conclusions, who was the scholar that I couldn't even write down everything right, provide a helpful perspective on the other framing devices that are in Judges 19 through 21. That is the repetition of the no king formula. We saw it at the beginning of 19.1, and the last verse of Judges says the same thing. There's no king of Israel at the time. The latter instance also contains the observation that, quote, all the people did what was right in their own eyes, which now we've heard a couple of times. And we first started hearing that, if you recall, from Samson, who uh, was looking at other women with that same kind of idea. And so this, this, this idea of people doing what's right in their own eyes also serves as a framing device for the larger unit of Judges 17 through 21. Now, because stories of the abuse of women served to pass judgment on male-dominated institutions, the no king formula of 19.1 and 21.25 cannot be construed as simply a setup for the monarch. Judges 19 through 21 and the entire book of Judges, when heard in its larger canonical context, lets us know that the male-dominated institution of kingship failed as miserably as the office of judge. What I'm saying is the judgment that we can have toward the, the, the society of the time of the judges from this story is not something that goes away in the time of the kings. In fact, the judgment that Judges 19 gives us of the society at that time is of what male dominated societies do to women. And it gives us that judgment by being honest with us about what happens. Now, from this larger canonical perspective, Judges, like all the books of the prophetic canon, is a powerful witness against any institution, including the monarchy, that fosters idolatry and disobedience and thus contributes to the injustice and brokenness of the human community. And these are terrible and terrifying stories of brokenness in these three chapters, this one and the next two. And they demonstrate graphically what happens when people are bent upon self-assertion and idolatry rather than submission to God and God's purposes. As such, they are a fitting and forceful conclusion to judges in which the people of God have been self-assertive and idolatrous from the beginning. Furthermore, from Gideon on, the judges themselves have increasingly demonstrated a self-assertion and idolatry that Israel is supposed to avoid. The spiral of progressive deterioration reaches its apex in Judges 19 to 21. It can't really get any worse anymore. By documenting the consequences of self-assertion and idolatry, Judges calls people in every age and time to repentance and points people to a more excellent way the way of covenant loyalty that finds expression in the pursuit of justice and righteousness. It is loyalty to God and God's ways that yield peace and life rather than hostility, abuse, violence, and death. Here's a Levite. We've seen it. You remember the Levite that we talked about last week? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Levites are being painted off as badly as everybody else. The people who are charged with doing the work of sharing things about God are painted off as badly as everybody else. What do people think of clergy these days in the world? You don't have to tell me. God knows <laughs> I'm one. Um, and I know I'm a mess. But a lot of these people who, who, who don't think they are, 
there's a reason clergy don't get respect anymore. There's a reason that the church is hemorrhaging members. We all know it. It's because the church has been just as guilty as ancient Israel. And we can always see that in relation to how it treats women. And I'll get into more of that, but I can't help myself. Now, while these three chapters do anticipate the monarchy and that the monarchy was explicitly entrusted with the embodiment of God's justice and righteousness, and in subsequent narratives in 1 Samuel, narrate the rise of the monarchy. But the failure of the monarchy illustrates that the essence of God's will involves not the perpetuation of any particular political structure. And I want to say this again. God's will does not care about any political structure. God's will is only about the establishment of justice and righteousness. And it's so easy for us to take a political structure and say this is the only thing that does it. And again, every time we do, we participate in idolatry. By showing how tragic and violent is the failure to honor God and embody God's purposes, these three chapters call people everywhere always to set self-centeredness aside, to embrace God's purposes for the world, and so to contribute to the shalom of the human community. That's wordy, but I like it. Now, although the judges, the quote, bringers of justice, that's what they're supposed to be, failed, and although the kings would fail as well, if there's good news that you find in any of these three chapters, it's this, God does not give up and God will not give up on God's purposes for the world. As Christians, from a Christian perspective, there would one day be a king in Israel. We say that Jesus of Nazareth. We're actually going to talk about that on Sunday, Palm Sunday coming up, as we say this king figure marches into Jerusalem, but nobody really understands what he means by a king figure. Because we want someone that we can lift up and whatever else. Jesus is this king figure from the divine that is a servant to all, who would truly embody God's justice, righteousness, and shalom, and who would gather a people to be devoted in loving the world as God loves the world. I think that might actually be the best way to talk about what it means to be a Christian. To participate and embody God's justice, righteousness, and shalom, and be devoted to loving the world as God loves the world. But of course, the Christian church has no reason to boast at all. The church's history is full of stories that often make it read like chapters and judges, even one of the texts of terror. The marginalization of the abuse of women has been something of the church. How about the abuse of children by the church? How about the violent self-assertion that the church has often attempted to cloak in religious garb, like um, Christians today saying that women have no right over their body? <sighs> I, I, if I didn't feel like I didn't have a choice, if I didn't feel like Jesus wouldn't leave me alone, I'm just not sure I could still feel comfortable in today's climate being a pastor. But I don't have a choice. So I will do my best in my broken way to constantly repent of my own ways and to call the Church of Jesus Christ to task for the ways it is still promoting great violence and injustice in this world, even while I know it makes me unpopular among my ilk. And yet, like all prophetic books, not only does the book of Judges warn and call to repentance, it does offer hope. To be sure, the hope resides not in the possibility that Israel, the church, will finally get things right. Israel seldom did, and the church seldom has. Rather, the hope lies in the God. And this is why I stay. And this is why I can't stay as well. Not only do I feel chosen and called or whatever else, I can't, I don't have a choice. But I believe and trust in God because this exists in the Bible to let me know that God hates it. 
that God hates the way the people of God break the world. Because we have a God, and I know this is true of any one of us who've experienced the divine reality. That even after God's people prove to be terribly faithless and unjust, God is unwilling to let us go. When we hear this book in its full biblical setting, the good news is that even when things cannot get any worse, the story is not over. God will try again and again to reach and to, to reach and to use a frustratingly faithless and disobedient people for the divine purposes. And God is still trying. I don't have faith in the church. I have faith in God and I have faith in Jesus who is the Christ. And this is what we call grace. Now this book, this chapter that we've already read, and let's see what let's see what comes from it. Chapter 19 begins exactly as chapter 18 did, terribly. And given the terrible things that happened in chapter 18, we should expect that chapter 19 will be no different. Like Chapter 17, chapter 19 features an unnamed Levite, and this does not bode well either. Unnamed Levites, if I encounter them in any other book by now, I'm just going to run the other. As a matter of fact, do you remember in the parable of the Good Samaritan, one of the two that passed by the person who was beaten and left for dead? A Levite. An hmm. unnamed Levite. Yes, thank you, Kathy. And sure enough, chapter 19 will reveal Israel at its very worst. Despite these negative clues at the beginning, however, the action actually begins with something that sounds like a promising note. That is an estranged couple seeming on the verge of being reunited. But there are several puzzling features in chapter 19. And the first involves that textual variant that we've already talked about. I don't know what to do with it. I really don't know what to do with it. So I'm not, not going to do anything with it other than their relationship doesn't make sense and it's not right. It's not the kind of relationship that God wants. A Levite takes for himself a concubine, someone less than a wife, as someone else said, maybe he's an older man just taking for himself a younger woman. Whatever she does, whether she's angry and has some agency or prostitutes herself just to get away from him, she gets back to her father's house where she's safe. And here comes this fellow to try to bring her back, to speak tenderly to her, which is the language of love. In any case, the Levite goes to the father's house to which the concubine has fled, and here he's welcomed warmly by the woman's father. We know nothing of her response. We don't know if she was happy to see him, terrified to see him or anything else, nor will we learn anything of her. She remains silent and nameless. And that is not taking away what she is. That's telling us how terrible the world has got. How many women have we heard named in Judges? Many more than most books of the Bible. How many women have we seen as heroic? Many more than most books of the Bible. And now it's just getting pathetically terrible because people are not trying to do what God wants. There's no shalom. There's no end to violence. There's no ways of doing anything in this world as I exist in a nation right now where people can figure I'm not going to get into any of that. You can read into any of this exactly what's going on in the world right now and we do nothing about it because we'd rather live in violence because we're far more concerned with getting what our selfish desires want than trying to figure out how to live with justice, peace, and shalom that God demands. Why do we have this passage today? Because it is just as important to us. And, and we still don't care. How many nameless, faceless, silent people die because of violence in our country we refuse to stop? Now, the nature of the social dynamics of the father's house is another puzzling feature, as we already mentioned, too. I don't know what's going on. The father's hospitality seems comically exaggerated, but why? Are the five days of eating and drinking a case of male bonding? That's what several scholars have suggested. 
and the effect of which is to emphasize the marginalization of the concubine. Again, when people die in terrible ways in our country, whose names do we remember in the history books as they eat over things discussing what to happen? The politicians who do nothing. Or does a father seek to detain the husband because he fears for his daughter's safety and wants to keep her in his household for as long as possible? Or is the exaggerated hospitality some kind of power play between the two and thereby a claim on the woman? Choose your poison. I'd like to think that it was the second that he's trying to protect his daughter. But then I wish that he would have done a better job. Because you can talk about it for five days, but if you let her go, it's like you didn't talk about it at all. Now, we don't know, but it's evident that concubine herself has been relegated to the role of object rather than the active subject she was in verse two. Not unusual, men are bargaining when male honor is at stake. Given the mo movement of the narrative, it's not surprising that when the Levite finally manages to tear himself away from her father's hospitality, the presence of the concubine is noticed almost as an afterthought in verse 10. Even the donkeys are mentioned before she is. Some scholars have suggested that chapters 17 through 21 are pro-Davidic material, as I've mentioned. If so, it's striking that Jebus Jerusalem is bypassed because it's a city of foreigners. And again, as I said, Gabeah, the home of Saul, looks all the worse because of this. However, this may just reflect the realities of the pre monarchic period, and it may not be some narrator trying to say that Saul's terrible and David's all right. In any case, the bypassing of Jerusalem sets up the tragic irony that is to follow. Gabeah, the place, is supposed to be safe. And it's not, it will be the site of horrible violence and inhospitality. The first sign that something is terribly wrong is that the Levite and his party reach the town square and no one puts them up for the night. We caught that right away. By the way, I'm grateful to ever hear how you all pick up on things in the Bible so well. What, a, what, a, what incredible biblical people you are. I don't know what to call it, but I appreciate that. Now, the custom of hospitality was and is characteristic of the Near East and in Israel, and it is, again, covenant loyalty. Uh, Steve, good job talking about Leviticus 19 that way, but we also see the hospitality exchange to strangers in Exodus 22, Exodus 23, Deuteronomy 16, and Deuteronomy 26. Hospitality to strangers is one of the most important things to God. Because God says, that's how I treated Israel when it was a stranger. And if you've ever experienced God be hospitable to you, welcoming to you, loving to you, what happens when you see a stranger and you know that that person is, in God's eyes, a miracle? Now, included among those who were supposed to receive special care are Levites. And that doesn't happen. This state of affairs is another graphic indication that the people of Israel were doing, quote, what is right in their own eyes. So as to emphasize that the people of Gebeah are Israelites and should have known better, the narrator twice reports the Benjamite identity of Gebeah. In addition, an old irony in the story is that the Levites were the ones entrusted to Israel with teaching the provisions of the covenant. We said in Deuteronomy 31. If Gebeah is any sign of what's typical in Israel, the Levites have failed as teachers of the law in regards to hospitality, at least, but I'm going to guess it's a whole lot more because we already know that Levite's been failing in many ways. The last nameless Levite we saw set up an idolatrous shrine and sold his services to the highest bidder. And as chapter 19 unfolds, this Levite doesn't appear much better. Why did he take for himself a concubine? Certainly common, but notice the verb. I've talked about that. I don't think it was that more. And even if he sought reconciliation with his strange concubine, he subsequently ignores her at best, not and best. And at worst, he is an accomplice in her murder. 
and his motive for seeking revenge against the Benjamites, an account of Gabiah's crime seems to have more to do with his own status than it does any concern for the murdered concubine. And we'll get more to that later. Everyone, even the people meant to teach about God, were doing what was right in their own eyes. Well, almost everyone. The old man. He is the only one who even shows any kind of peace. Now, of course, this old man was a stranger or sojourner in Gibeah himself, so his actions served to throw even more, even shorter focus, the inhospitality of the people of Gibeah. The Levite and his concubine will have anything, but I am changing that one since I can quickly, but the peace wished by the old man. If their ignoring of the Levite and his party was the first sign of their inhospitality, it pales to what we see next. The men, or maybe an undesirable element of the men who were there, which goes unchallenged and unhindered by the larger population, move rapidly from inhospitality to sheer brutality. They have a desire to have intercourse with the Levite. And I will say this until the cows come home. This has nothing to do with what we call homosexuality. And anyone who uses this or Genesis 19 to try to condemn homosexuality demonstrates not only a lack of awareness of the biblical scriptures as a whole, but only their desire to try to promote violence against people they simply don't like. And are doing the very thing that this text warns people against. This is not a sin of homosexuality. It's a sin of hospitality or rather inhospitality. The men of Gebeah intend to demonstrate their complete superiority over the Levite by subjecting him to what amounted in their culture to utter humiliation. It's the exact same thing that they did in Genesis 19, and that both chapters are 19. Well, it helps me remember that. <laughs> Why they want to do this isn't clear, except to say that their behavior is a graphic illustration of the violence that ultimately happens when people pursue what's right in their own eyes. What are other ways we might try to rape people who come to visit us? That's an odd question and you don't need to answer it. What are other ways we're not being hospitable to those who are in our midst? What are other ways that we try to do what's right in our own eyes and not worry about those who are strangers? Now, indeed, this framing device you know, for chapter 17 to 21 is echoed in what the old man says to the men of Gebeah when he offers them his virgin daughter and the Levite's concubine, do whatever you want to them. Or more literally, the Hebrew can be read, do to them what's good in your own eyes. And they did. The behavior of the men of Gebeah obviously recalls Genesis 19 and the behavior of the men of Sodom. In Genesis 19 as well, the issue is not homosexuality, but inhospitality. And if you think that I'm just making this up, read Ezekiel 16 for me, please, because Ezekiel will tell you exactly what the sin was of Sodom. Obviously, too, in both Genesis 19 and Judges 19, the brunt of the mistreatment falls upon women. There is no question that both texts reflect the patriarchal culture in which the customs of hospitality favored males. In Judges 19, the old man that hosts the Levite and his party recognizes that it would be a greater breach of hospitality for the men of Gebeah to rape the, man, the Levite than it would be for them to rape his own daughter and the concubine. So he offers the two of them instead. This is not to say that the prevailing customs of the day would not have viewed the behavior of the men of Gebeah as an outrage. They certainly would have. While the mistreatment of women may have been the lesser of two evils, according to the customs of the time, it would have been viewed as an act of terror. And the whole context of Judges 17 through 21 presents the actions of these men as a worst case scenario. What happens when people act out of self-assertion rather than divine will? When people do what's right in their own eyes, violent chaos follows. 
The horror of the scene involves not just the rape of the concubine by the men of Gabea, but also the treatment accorded to her by her husband. Apparently, the Levite doesn't even stay awake to see what happens. He makes no attempt to help, nor does he seem to care at all about what happens to the woman. Rather, after waking in the morning and getting ready to leave, he almost trips over the concubine who lies prostrate in the doorway. But did you notice the phrase as I read it that her hand was on the threshing there? It, what a terrible image. She stumbles there and this man who went to speak lovingly to her doesn't even bother to open the door. And notice what he says, get up, we're leaving. He doesn't even know if she's dead or alive, and neither do we. The Hebrew doesn't let us know if she's dead or alive. She may be alive. The lack of response implies that she's dead, but the uncertainty in the Hebrew only increases the horror of the whole passage. Dead or alive, she's hoisted onto a donkey like a sack of wheat. The text offers no sense the Levite has any emotional response. He's totally self-absorbed, unremorseful, and unfeeling. And the men of Gibeah aren't the only ones doing what's right in their own eyes. So are the Levites. So is this Levite, who above all should know better and have done better. That she is put on a donkey recalls Judges 114. You don't need to remember that. That was months ago. Where a woman... Aksa is also riding the donkey. Now the two scenes from this tragic envelope structure for judges, where Aksa is an active subject stating her desire for a present or a blessing from her father and getting it. She's celebrated, she's doing well. She has a name, she has agency, she talks. The Levite's concubine remains nameless and without a voice on her donkey. Whereas Aksa proper's, the Levite's concubine is unspeakably victimized. And again, this is part of the larger pattern of judges and what can so easily be going on in so many societies. The progressive deterioration starts with Gideon and gets here is signaled in major part by the increasing violence against women. In the case, then and now, that the disease of a society manifests itself in the abuse of women. Let me say that in a different way. You can tell how bad a society is by the way it treats its women. Have you seen the pictures in Iran before the revolution in 79? How those women got to be and the ways they were able to dress and things of that nature. And now what happens there when they try to do things? We've taken a step back in our country. Happily so, so many Christians proclaim. Mm -hmm. Ah, which makes me sick. Violence against women in the Old Testament serves to communicate the degradation and disarray of social structure. It's not there for some kind of violence porn. It's there to warn us it's there to make us look at it so we can't turn our heads. It's there to make sure we can't keep blinders on in our own society. In Genesis 34 and 2 Samuel 13, as well as in Judges 19 through 21, the Hebrew verb, I don't know how to say it. It's, uh, you can't see that when I'm pointing at it, but this little piece here is a separate like thing. Like, it's like that. It's a yod. And then an NH kind of thing. And, and that verb is translated ravish or rape in those three sections of the Bible. And it always occurs along with the Hebrew word nabala, which means a vile thing or a vile outrage. In all three texts, the rape of woman, whether it's Dinah in Genesis or the Levites concubine in our text today or Tamar in 2 Samuel 13, points to the unraveling of the larger social fabric. Genesis, Judges, 2 Samuel, they're all trying to tell us what happens 
when we allow ourselves to go crazy, do whatever we want and try to, basically if women are being harmed, society is just breaking apart. These stories and the use of vile outrage points to an understanding that the gravity of the crime isn't just against the individuals involved, but it is also a disruption and violators and violations against the, hu the, cu the community itself. There are, it violates the community itself. That was probably what I meant. Um, when women are harmed in these ways, the whole community falters fails and disintegrates. Here, Judges shows that the Israelite community life has completely been destroyed. Everyone is doing what's right in their own eyes and violence is what happens when that happens. Unless we're tempted to feel superior or dismiss the Bible as a violent text, it is essential that we recognize the contemporary, I can't even say that word, and that's why I quoted it, contemporaneity, is that even, it's a word, it didn't underline it, um, of the story. <laughs> this is from Phyllis Tribble. Not triple, but Tribble, and that was an autocorrect. They don't like Tribble. Boom, boom. The problem is not just that ancient Israelites were self-assertive and violent, but rather the problem is also that we are self-assertive and violent. Violence against women is at least as much as a present reality as it was the ancient reality. According to Tribble, Judges 19 finally calls us to repentance. In doing so, it functions like the whole book of Judges and the entire prophetic canon. By describing as clearly and graphically as possible the horror terror-filled, violent consequences of human self-assertion and idolatry, the prophetic canon invites repentance and conformity of self and society to the just, righteous, and peaceful purposes of God. However, women are not the only victims of such a society. We will see, because of these actions, nearly the whole tribe of Benjamin wiped out here in a society where people pursue their own self-interest rather than the purposes of god women often lose first and then everyone eventually loses the levite suddenly bent on revenge brutalizes the woman further by dismembering her corpse this action has no redeeming social value why it may be a, par a parody of saul cutting a uh, 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 some animal, I don't remember which animal it was, uh, in 1 Samuel uh, 11, uh, and sending the pieces to Israel to call them to action. This Levite's doing the same thing, but he has no more concern for his murdered wife than he did while she was being raped and killed. His motive for summoning the Israelites seems to be because he feels insulted. In his mind, the real outrage is that he has been denied hospitality and then, and thus dishonored by the men of Gebeah, not that his concubine was raped and murdered. And if this is the case, like it seems to me, then the Levites' consistent self-absorption is further evidence that Israel is a society in chaos. His brutal invitation directly leads to what happens next. And it's brutal civil war. And it's more terror. How are you holding up? Two more chapters of this. We won't do next week. Next week's Holy Week. <laughs> After that, we won't do the week, and we won't do the week after because after that is is I'm on vacation. Um, I would love to think that I'm going to try to do the next two chapters the week thereafter, so three weeks from today, because I don't want to do judges anymore. <laughs> the feelings mutual, but. When people tell me that they ignore the Bible because it's violent, I'm proud.
to be a part of a church that won't ignore it. Because in the midst of the violence of the Old Testament and New Testament, like we hell, we read Revelation. Is there not violence in the New Testament? It forces us to acknowledge the violence in the world and to again be called to be better. You know, people are like it's so violent. Look how terrible they were. I just tell someone, open your eyes and tell me it's any better. And I will call you a liar. Questions, comments. Thank God. What? <laughs> <laughs> we spoke to you soon. What? What? Uh, uh, chapter and verse in Samuel did you quote as as another example of dividing? Uh, it was Samuel. First Samuel, chapter eleven. Saul divides uh, some kind of animal and, and uses it as a way of bringing the people uh, of Israel. He calls them basically for a battle by doing that. And the only reason I reference that, it's the only other thing. Um, so here. Oh, I don't know. Where is it? Now Saul coming from the hill behind the oxen, blah, 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 blah. It's there. Read 1 Samuel 11. Tell me tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> now I'm going to let it. Yeah. yeah. Then we'll have fun. You all, I can promise you one thing. We've been through some of the very worst things of the Bible, and I don't think it gets any worse. I hate this story. And yet this is one of the stories I have spent the most time in. Um, in doctoral things and such as well. Uh, because I, again, I, I honestly believe that taking these terrible stories seriously allows us to seriously be able to look at the world and do a better job. And so I'm sorry if this has been terrible for you. God's not done. And as we go into Holy Week, don't forget that even though on Palm Sunday, we might try to cheer and we can ignore the whole thing until Easter where we cheer again. We live in a Good Friday world. And we cannot be an Easter people living in an Easter world. We are an Easter people living in a Good Friday world. So let's not skip the Good Fridays because we don't like them. Because without them, our Easter people means nothing. Let's pray. God, I wish I had some more good news for this. Maybe you do as well. Maybe you look over this whole world with its violence and children still dying in schools. Oh, and war going on and greedy people being greedy and violent people being violent and people doing whatever they want. It's ever right in their own eyes and you just wish you could shake us and say, do better. I can't shake the world, but I can be shaken by your scriptures. So shake me and shake any of us who's willing to actually be transformed, that we might repent and do better. Thank you for joining us so we're not alone. And thank you for not giving up on us, even though when we read these things, we want to give up. Now, let us not give up on the world either, but love it as you love it so that it might know it's a more beautiful place than it knows it is. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank All you, right, Garrett. dear souls. Oh. <laughs>